welcome to all of those online and for all of those who want to watch on some of the social media platforms. May the Lord bless you as you join us in our service today. Thank you for being with us, family of God. It's December. Turn to your neighbor and say, December. What has happened to the year? I think for some of us, we are glad that we've seen the, the back end of 2021. Can I get an amen? amen? We're looking forward to new things in the new year. I think for some of us, the last two years have probably been some of the most difficult two years of our lives. We have found it difficult to cope with so much of the world as it is today. So I'm starting a three-part series as we prepare our hearts to celebrate Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We know that over 2,000 years ago, he was born to Mary and Joseph in a little town in Bethlehem. And we celebrate with the rest of the world our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, and in doing so, as you see on the wall behind me, Jesus came before and Jesus will come again. Some of you sound excited. Let's try again. Jesus came before and Jesus will come again. He's coming again to meet his children, to take his children home. And so we're very excited about that. Uh, we're living in very perilous times and uh, we are very open to deception, confusion. There's so much happening in our world that it's very easy for us to get lost. And the world is relying on us as pastors, as leaders, as spiritual um, family. The Bible tells us in Ephesians that the church has been given pastors, prophets, evangelists, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, what's the other one? Prophets, teachers, uh, apostles, to help us, to strengthen us in our faith and to be those secure leaders who will help us uh, grow in our faith, grow into truth. We are living in perilous times. I, I saw an article this week which reminded me of that. It was written by Dr. Robert Malone, who was one of the inventors of the mRNA vaccine. And he said that the precursor to for mass formation psychosis is a situation where people are fragmented that nobody is feeling connected and even though we're in a generation where everybody's connected on our phones we are living in a generation where people have never felt so disconnected before from one another we're in a place of confusion and so we're all looking for answers and so we are so um what's a word i'm looking for open to hypnotic suggestion for leaders who are going to speak into that situation of crisis. And we, we have or are experiencing what is known as free-floating anxiety, where we don't even know what we're anxious about. We can't put our finger on it. Uh, the world doesn't make sense right now, and, and we really just don't know how to explain things. Which leads also to free-floating discontent. In other words, I don't like what's happening, and I don't know what I can do about it. I think I'm not alone in saying that I'm having sleepless nights sometimes and I'm wrestling. My mind is uh, constantly asking, God, what's going on? How can we speak into the situation? And many of us focus on the media, trying to make sense, getting world leaders to help us navigate the this, this situation to protect our children. But this is akin to hypnosis, where we're all sitting in front of our media and there's things coming through our screen telling us, what we should do and how we should behave. And we begin to lose our ability for rational thought and judgment, to start thinking for ourselves because we find ourselves in this place of anxiety. Finally, we find ourselves in a place where anybody who doesn't say what the official narrative is gets attacked because you don't want us to get better. You don't want us to get out of this. Either we're all pulling together in the same direction or we're not on the same team. People are being isolated into groups. I think there are more little subgroups, sub, sub, subgroups of humanity now than ever before. All living in our own little corner, trying to protect our own space. And we're seeing that the world is moving towards a coordinated global focus that is deploying a totalitarian world government. 
I don't say these things lightly. And I also say that the, world pop the population is going to go that way whether we like it or not. These things are written in the scripture. That this is what is going to happen. Some of us are waking up and saying we need to break free. Our minds need to be set free. Our hearts need to be set free. We need to find the truth. Not just take what the world is telling us. So I'm blessed and reminding you today that as I stand here, God has a plan for you. God has not abandoned you. God is with you and he is for you. Last week as I was in prayer and preparation, a good friend of mine, Pastor Chris Zeely from South Africa, who some of you have met and heard him preach from this pulpit, he sent me a message which I felt I needed to share with you today. He said this, May the Lord bless you with his presence. There is such a sense of destiny over your church for the coming season. Amen. Amen. An excitement and expectation to hear what God is doing. May the Lord anoint you with what is good and gracious in his kingdom. And he said it is a time of multiplication. We heard that last word last week. It is a time of multiplication. A time of harvest. A time of stretching the tent curtains wide. And I love how he ended his message to me. He said your positioning is right for the coming time for Zimbabwe and beyond. So as you sit here, yes, let's give the Lord a clap our friend for that. Come on. That's a prophetic word that God is speaking to us. So as I speak this word, may the Lord stir within your hearts His purpose and design for you during this season. There is a lot of confusion and we need to hear the clarity call of the voice of God. Jesus came before. Jesus is coming Again. Amen. Just as those shepherds were in the field that night, sitting, watching, washing their socks by night, as we used to sing. No, no, washing their socks at night, watching their flocks at night, looking to the skies, waiting for their Savior to come, the one that would deliver them from oppression, deliver them from pain, lead them. Into a place of freedom. Read in Luke chapter 2. And as they were guarding their sheep, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to them. The radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. When Jesus comes, his news brings us joy, brings us peace, not confusion, not fear. And so they rushed to the place where Jesus was and saw the little baby born to Mary and Joseph in a manger in that little town in Bethlehem. And they rejoiced that the Savior had come. When Jesus grew up as a man, he began to tell us stories. And we find one of them in Luke 21 when the disciples said, what will happen when you return? How will we know that you're coming back? And Jesus said there will be strange signs in the sun, moon, and stars. In other words, in the heavenlies, there will be strange things happening. But here on earth, the nations will be in turmoil, perplexed by the roaring seas and strange tides. People will be terrified. Now listen to what Jesus said. The angel said there will be peace when it concerns Jesus. There will be rejoicing when Jesus comes. But now when we look at the signs around us, people will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth. And the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. So when these things begin to happen, stand and look up. Turn to your neighbor and say, look up. Stand and look up. That's what the message is entitled today. Look up. For your salvation is near. 
So right at the end of Jesus' ministry, he had, uh, was crucified on the cross for you and I. He died a cruel and horrible death, but on the third day he rose again. He showed himself to his disciples, and after some time, he ascended into heaven. And we read that story in the book of Acts, where he says the apostles were with Jesus, and they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has authority to set those dates and times. They're not for you to know, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He said, God will be with you, even though I'm gone physically, God will be with you by His Spirit. Do not be afraid. You will be empowered for the times in which you live. And after the saying, He was taken up into the clouds, and they were watching, they could no longer see Him, and as they strained to see Him, rising in the heavens, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them and said, men, men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven. Jesus said, Jesus has been taken away from you into heaven, but someday, someday, he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Jesus came before. Jesus will come again. But just as we know, God is the author of salvation. God is the author of love. God is the author of hope. Satan is a real creature. It's a real being. The Bible tells us there was a whole host that rebelled with him. And everything that God made good, Satan sought to undermine, to twist, to corrupt, and to destroy. So when God gives us love, Satan turns it to lust. <coughs> everything that God wants to give us, Satan wants to Correct. So we're warned that in the same way that Jesus prepares the way, Satan will deceive us by twisting the truth. Now stay with me because today is a very important message that you've never heard being preached from this pulpit before. It's a message of our time and it's for our time. And it's not for us to be fearful because our focus is always on Jesus Christ. But it's for us to be aware of his coming soon. Jesus said you will know by the signs around you. Even in Deuteronomy, the Old Testament, we were warned about some of the signs. In 4 verse 19, he said, When you look up into the sky and you see the sun and moon and stars and all the forces of heaven. He's talking about spiritual forces. The, the demons, the fallen angels, the powers, principalities and powers that we read about in Ephesians. Don't be seduced into worshipping them. Tell your neighbor, don't worship them. Don't worship them. Jesus himself said, For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up, perform great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even God's elect. And that's why I'm speaking to you on this message today. So that you cannot say, the pastor never told me. Someone never told me. We are being deceived and we did not know about these things. Because he said, even those who are chosen to be the children of God may be deceived. Do you know in the bank, they don't teach them which are the false notes, the fake notes. They give them the real notes. And you work so much with the real notes that when there's a fake note, you know it straight away. It feels fake, it looks fake, you say, this is a fake note. You don't focus on the fakes because there's so many fakes out there, you focus on the real thing. When you focus on the real thing, the fake becomes evident. My focus throughout this whole message is let's focus on the real thing. Let's focus on Jesus. But remember in 2 Thessalonians, it says this, that this man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power. Remember God gives real power? Comes with counterfeit power. And signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God would cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Jesus came before. Jesus is coming again. But there is an enemy who is wanting to deceive you by also turning your eyes to the skies to look for your Savior. 
Just as we are looking as believers and waiting in the skies to see our Savior, so Satan is starting to manipulate the world in which we live. So the question that's being asked of the world today is, is there anybody out there? Is there anybody out there? We have such a huge galaxy, such a huge universe. Is there anything out there? Do we know? There are telescopes pointed into space right now, searching for some kind of extraterrestrial life, some kind of signal in space. Perhaps maybe the aliens are going to come down and give us an alien Christmas. Yeah? Celebrate us and say, let's celebrate together that, that, that their Savior has arrived, our Savior has arrived. But you know, when we go back to the existing paradigm that the world is being taught, and I was speaking to somebody uh, just after our first service, they said this is being taught in our schools even now, the theory of Darwin. It says that we come from some kind of cosmic bang, some amoeba, some cells that have started to mutate and slowly we move from, from some creature that crawled out of the ocean slime and slowly started to make its way on two legs to finally become who we are. That's the theory being taught. We all know the theory. But do we believe the theory or do we know that an all-loving, all-powerful God created you and I for a purpose, on purpose and with a purpose? We do not crawl out of some sea somewhere. God created us on purpose and breathed His Spirit into us. God said, let us make man in His image. In our image, said God, as He created us. We are made in the image of God. So where then did this kind of weird cosmic burst of energy come from? Well, even as I was preparing this week, for the message, BBC, I have the BBC app to catch up on the news, came up with an article uh, by a very well-renowned scientist talking about this. Said, are we thinking about alien life or wrong? And now there's a, the, 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 the idea that's being propagated right now as I stand on the stage among scientists around the world is the idea of panspermia. In other words, the cosmic life came from alien, outsourced. So somewhere in the explosion of life is all these rocks and asteroids floating around space. One of them somewhere had some kind of um, DNA, some kind of alien stuff on it. And when it crashed into our Earth, there was a huge explosion. That's the moment of impact where life was conducive for this alien DNA to take hold and bring birth to the human race. In other words, we are born of alien origin. So it's being spoken. Not just like weird stuff. These are the respected scientists of the day trying to discover where did life come from. Many of you have heard, maybe aliens built the pyramids. Maybe aliens. Well, we have all these stories. And then maybe the aliens will one day return to take us home. To help us find fulfillment. To bring us healing. You say, that's weird, man. We preach these things in church. Listen, if we don't start addressing some of the issues that's been spoken of down there from the pulpit, how will we know how to respond as believers? All of you at some point in time have thought about these things. Have been asked, what do you think about aliens? Where have they come from? What are they doing? But it seems right now, this is, because we're living in this age of floating anxiety, floating, you know, we're trying to find out what's wrong with our world. Everybody's opened their minds up to, to influence from others telling us who we are and where we should be going. Now, for some of you, it's not so strange because in Zimbabwe, there are people here. I'm sure that even sitting amongst us, we had someone after the first service said that I've seen some strange things in the sky. In fact, in Bulawayo in 1953, a photograph was taken of a UFO over Bulawayo. Did I believe you? Look it up. Look it on your phone. It's a famous photograph of an unidentified flying saucer flying over the city of Bulawayo in the 1950s. 
Apparently, a UFO landed in Rua, just outside Marinero, in a, a school, just outside the school playground. The kids ran out. There was, it was witnessed by over 64 children, I think they counted. They had interviews with the children. People came from all over the world. They did drawings. They corroborated their stories. It's there. The, the government didn't say much about it in our country at the time, but it's there on, online. You're welcome to go and look into it. And so there are people that have seen things that they cannot explain. Apparently, these beings came out of the spacecraft and communicated with their minds to some of the children, telling them that they need to look after the planet. Because if they don't, then in some future there will be a disaster in the planet, and they will need to come and save the planet from its own destru destruction. And as early, right? I mean, as late as 2021, in March 2021, apparently there was a flying saucer uh, spotted in Chipinge, seen by numerous people. Somebody tried to take a picture of it. They said it was moving too fast. And so that's the picture that's online. But it, apparently there was witnesses all over who had witnessed that there was something strange in the skies of Chipinge, even in 2021. I remember I was in art college here in Bulawayo, and there were reported sightings of lights coming across Bulawayo. And people were in their cars chasing them and trying to see them. What's going on in the skies? So most of you know, these things are not strange to us. We've seen it on TV. In fact, this year, uh, last year, there was uh, official footage of, they call them now UAPs, or uh, Unexplained Aerial Phenomena, rather than UFOs. They were seen um, over the ocean by uh, pilots, Navy pilots, who tried to track them. You can find this footage also. It was even shown on the news, on mainstream news, CNN, Fox, BBC, they, they spoke to the pilots. What did they see? They captured them, these white disks that were going in and out of the ocean and flying at, at things they've never experienced before. Which has led the government in America to start talking about them openly. And in fact, this year they released disclosure of UAP in a document to say these things exist and we do not know what they are. Before they said there's no such thing, you know, they're hiding. We're now moving to a place of what we call disclosure, where official um, authority figures are now stepping out to say these things exist and we need to find out are they malevolent, are they benevolent, are they, are they good, are they bad, what are they here for? So what is our response as leaders? What are our thoughts? Where do they come from? What are they? People are looking to the skies. People are looking to the skies. You know, some of the older generation, they're like, whoa, this is just weird, man. I can imagine some of the dinner conversations, lunchtime. Oh, how was church today? Very interesting. What did the pastor speak on? Aliens. <laughs> sure. What church do you go to? It's not something often spoken about. But we're living in a time where in the last two years, in fact, last year, 2020, was known as the year of the UFO. Because there were so many sightings and there was so much focus on what's happening in other states. So one of the questions is, are they, are they angels? Are they angels? This often comes from non-believers who don't believe the Bible, say, well, they're angels. Perhaps the terminology is different in those days. So when they saw it, it's an angel. Today we'd say it's a flying source. But you've got to understand that first... Mortal bodies are required of extraterrestrials. They say they've crashed and they've done tests on them. But the Bible tells us that angels do not have mortal bodies. Angels are everlasting. It says in Mark 12, verse 25, they are neither given in marriage, but angels in heaven are there forever. Thirdly, angels never needed a flying saucer to move around. They appeared and they disappeared. It didn't say, the angels at night looked up and saw the angels. I mean, the shepherds at night looked up and saw the angels. And they sang, Hosanna in the highest. And they got in their flying saucer and flew off. But fourthly, if it's misidentified as angels in the New Testament, it would be illogical to try and use the Bible to prove if they were angels because they don't believe the Bible in the first place. They want to use the Bible to prove it, then they need to accept that the Bible is truth. And when we look at these beings and we consider the description of what the role of angels is in Scripture, 
compared to what these beings are doing, they do not line up. Hello? Scripture tells us angels rescue only the followers of Jesus at the rapture and his second coming. That's found in Matthew 24, 31, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 18, 2 Thessalonians verse 1. The angels are there to help believers. Secondly, the angels announce that Jesus is the Messiah. You don't hear many stories of saying, we saw a UFO. The aliens came out and said, Jesus is the king. No. Angels are inferior and subject to Jesus Christ. Angels carry out the wrath of God on earth and unbelievers in the end times. And of course, if you had said aliens, aliens come, aliens, it doesn't match up. And anyone who has an encounter with an alien, we see these stories all over the internet. The encounter always leaves him with fear that they're doing tests, that they're in depression, that they're suicidal, that they're fearful of these things. That's no angel. That's no angel. So perhaps extrials are fallen angels. Are they supernatural beings created in the heavens? Well, Scripture gives us a glance into this. In Genesis 1, verses 6, uh, Genesis 6, verses 1 and 2, and verse 4, we read this strange Scripture which says, The sons of God, and in the terminology it means those that are part of what they call the divine council, which is again mentioned in the Psalms and some of the other books, like the book of Job. The divine council, the sons of God, saw the beautiful woman and took any they wanted as their wives. For in those days and some days after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth. For whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. It's there in our scriptures. It says that these angels, according to the book of Enoch, which is also referred to by Jesus and his disciples, came down here on this earth. They made a pact to corrupt the seed of mankind. Remember, whatever Jesus made him pure, whatever God made pure, Satan seeks to corrupt. Whatever is holy, Satan seeks to corrupt. Because remember, in the promise in the garden uh, that, that God gave, he said that you, your descendant, would crush the serpent under your feet. Your seed will be the downfall of Satan. Since that day, Satan has tried to destroy the very seed, the sacredness, the holiness of our being made in the image of God. He's tried to destroy it. If I'm made in God's image, every time Satan and his dominion, uh, his minions see you, they see God. And so they want to destroy that by destroying your DNA, by destroying your seed. And that's why we read the very next uh, couple of verses when it says, Noah was a righteous man. The only blameless, and the, and the original translation of blameless means pure without corruption. He was not an innocent as in he didn't sin. It means he did not have a bloodline that was corrupt. He did not have corrupt DNA. He was a pure man. And he walked in close fellowship with God and God saw that in the earth that it had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world and everyone on earth was corrupt. And that's why God sent a flood to destroy the corruption. Every culture has a story of its heroes and myths and legends of the gods having sex with humans and creating these legends like Hercules and Zeus. There's the Norse gods, the Greek gods, the Roman gods, the African gods. Still to this day, there are stories of how superhumans have, have been involved in creation, in our lives. So I'm going to say, this is really weird. You young people don't think so. They all watch Marvel movies. Where do they come from? Wormholes, gods, having sex with humans, creating super beings, superpowers. Everyone wants superpowers. Fly faster. Be stronger. You know, we do that as kids. We get together. Viewers from the superhuman. What power would you have? Visibility. Fast speed. You know, we joke around that. Because why? In the back of our minds, there's a sense. 
is a sense that something is not quite right with humanity. And what do the superheroes do? They want to save. They become the saviors of mankind. We've turned our eyes away from Jesus, looking to our saviors from the skies. Hello? Is anybody still with me? Scripture's clear. Our focus is Jesus. Yet the world is transitioning our thoughts to superhero saviors from the skies. Jesus himself. When they said, how do we know you're coming back? Jesus said this, when the Son of Man returns, talking of himself, it will be like it was in Noah's day. What was he referring to? It's not really clear in the text. But one thing is clear, and there's becoming greater consensus among those who study this kind of phenomenon around the world. It's becoming more clear to them that these uh, phenomena are not from distant planets. Because when we look at the times involved, the light years, the millions of light years, the, the distance planets are from each other, they cannot come from other planets. They are now coming to the conclusion that they come from other dimensions. Those of you who understand and study science hear things about different dimensions, different time-space continuums, where things are outside of what we can see, feel, hear, and, and see, and, and taste. There's other realms in which these things can be made manifest. But remember, who is the original? Who's the king? It's Jesus. We give an insight to him coming from a different realm in John chapter 1. What does it say in John chapter 1? In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. That's the true light. So the word became the word which lived with God in heaven, became flesh, put on human flesh. He made his home among us. Jesus came before. He clothed himself in humanity. He came and he died a cruel and horrible death so that we can access the heart of Father. says he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. We have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father or can get to know the heart of the Father, can even see the Father except through me. That's the life. That's the way. That's the Bible that we read. Those are the scriptures we learn that resonate in our hearts. So I'm not just surprised. In Corinthians 11, verse 14 and 15, I'm not surprised, Paul writes, that Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. Appearing in the sky. Disappearing in the sky. It's no wonder that his servants also, the powers and principalities, disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. So in the end, they will get the punishment for the wicked deeds that they deserve. Question I'm asking. Are these unexplained phenomena fallen angels here to carry out the work of Satan appearing and disappearing bringing people in to test and study to find out how they can corrupt our humanity. So I have a question for you. If one of these extraterrestrial races were to come and land on the lawn of the president's house in Zimbabwe, or land on the Bulawayo Green, you know, or the Barham Green Sports Club field, and say, here we are! 
Would that shake your faith? How would that affect your faith? No. I believe any extraterrestrial reality could only shake our faith if we as Christians allow it to shake our faith. If there is an extraterrestrial reality and is not demonic in nature, then it may not conflict with some of the biblical passages. I don't know. We don't have some of these answers. And it's very dangerous for us to start to make a theology based on some of the things that we think. This happened very long ago when we learned from the 15th to the 19th century where they had what they called the Age of Discovery, where the people in Europe who were brought up on the Bible and the, the Christian faith decided we're going to send people out and discover the world. Christopher Columbus going off on the ships. And those of you who like history, remember there were some maps that used to have dragons on the edge of the maps. And it says, there be dragons. Because we don't know what's there. We haven't explored it yet. And they had all these fanciful notions that there's creatures out there, there's weird things out there. And when they crossed the seas and went to places like North America, South America, Australia, all over the world, guess what? They discovered there were people there. Now the question comes, where did these people come from? So now they've got to start thinking about their theology. Remember, right about this time, Darwin started thinking about his theory and said, well, this explains a theory now. We all grew up in different places and some of us grew up here and grew up there and we all adapted and that's how the different races came. And the Christians are now saying, well, what do we believe? Because we believe the Bible and now the Bible doesn't say really what happened. It's not clear. So people came up with theories that are damaging to this very day. Even in our society, people say, oh, you know, I remember years ago, growing up in a South African context, they said, well, black people are not Christians. They don't have a soul because they didn't descend from Adam. How did they come about? That came from the theories of people trying to explain where other cultures came from. And they are hurting us even today, where there are tribes and people who said these people can't be Christians. These people can't be made in the image of God. These people cannot have the Spirit of God in them. Because they look different, they, they do different things. Where are these people from? So it's done us great damage to try and take scriptures and make meaning where there was no meaning. Am I making sense? Some of you have heard these things. You look at me like I'm shocked. Because you don't hear these things preached from the pulpit. But you've all heard these things before. So we've got to get back to the truth of God's word. So yeah, the, the people growing up in that time, it's a very relatively short space of time. They were in great conflict because they said, I love God and I want to believe the Bible. But there's questions the Bible doesn't answer. It makes it difficult. And it was a great opportunity for those who didn't want to submit to the authority of God to now say there is no God. We came from some amoeba and we all developed differently. Some space transformia stuff. And so we have this fallacy of what we call hyperliteralism, and we must be careful as a church not to adopt this. What does that mean? It means we take everything literally in the Bible. Sometimes the Bible is written in parables. When Jesus said, You are the salt and the light, he did not literally mean you are salt. Let's take Montana and cut her up and put her in a salt cellar because she's salt. No, it's, a, it's an interpretation. It's a, it's a, so there's much in Scripture that when we read it, we understand the message, but we don't take it literally. There are some things we need to take literally, and that's why we've got to look at everything in context. The Bible provides context for us and which passages to understand. Now, on the subject of UFOs, there's some things in Scripture that we cannot explain or we can talk about concerning directly the scriptures. And so that's why we need to just be very careful in approaching, in approaching subjects like this. I like what the one writer wrote. He said, we shouldn't expect the Bible to have the burden of explaining the meaning, origin, and existence of everything that we currently experience and might discover in the future. 
Forcing the Bible to be something it's not, was never intended to be, has led to the literal life and death situations with damaging consequences. Instead, we need to know that the, what the Bible actually is. It's a theological collection of books inspired by the Holy Spirit, revealing the heart of God and how we can get to know Him and be saved through Jesus Christ. The Bible also needs to be taken in context where it was written and in context with itself. But we need to treat, treat everybody as image bearers of the Lord Jesus. Treat everyone with respect. People who are different from us, treat them with respect. Treat them with love. So we've got to learn from the mistakes of the past. I personally believe that unidentified flying objects or whatever UAPs you may call them are demonic in origin. Because they seemed to be designed to take our eyes off Jesus. It seems to me that their purpose is to distract us from the things of God. And the truth is that we simply do not know everything. So we cannot allow our faith to be shaken if something happens that we can't explain. We need to learn from the past. But it's a good idea for us to talk about these things now, begin thinking about them now, so that we're able to have open discussions with people without feeling threatened or feeling like, We've got to defend God properly. Or God doesn't need our defense. Because you're going to meet people who think differently to you. You must be able to share your faith without feeling defensive of what you believe. Know what you believe and share your faith with them. Openly and honestly. More people in a recent survey has shown to believe in the existence of aliens than they do in the existence of God. And we don't seem to address these issues. But the world is ready. For Christians, whether we agree on extraterrestrial, the question is not nearly as important as what we have in common. We all accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. We all have a promise of redemption. And when this physical life is finished, we will spend an eternity together. So let's learn from humanity's past mistakes and let's cultivate unity with one another. So why now? Why now? Why is this being brought out of the box now? Well, I believe that it's part of the end game that's described in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation shows us that things are heating up. This week we're talking about looking up. Next week we'll talk about looking around and trying to discern some of the times around us in the light of Scripture. But if you have, a, have an awareness that we are being conditioned to a specific way of thinking, I want you to wake up. That's my purpose this morning, is to wake you up. And realize we can't live in an isolated box. There are things that the world is talking about that we need to be aware of. Where do we as believers stand on these issues? Why now? Well, because there's so much happening. The messaging that's coming. Science. There's a pandemic. People are filled with fear. They're running away from this and that. And they're looking for some kind of savior. Looking for somebody to help us. This vaccine. No, it's not working anymore. What about this one? It's not working. We need something permanent. What about climate change? See, there's a problem. Before we can say, ah, it's the Russians, it's the Chinese, it's the Americans, it's Australians, it's the British. We can blame somebody and we can get an army to fight them. But how do we fight climate change when we're all in this together? Maybe the answer will come from me. Bring some kind of new technology and help us save us from ourselves. That's some of the messages being given. So when they come, we can welcome them because they have an advanced race with advanced technology, with advanced medication. What about the politics? You see the world moving in a political narrative that is starting to move us more and more to what the Bible talks about as a one world government, a one world religion, a one world currency. Where do these come from? Is this out of my head? Is this some kind of conspiracy theory? It's written in the book of Revelation. We're moving in that direction. If we're not prepared for some of the things that are happening on around us, we need to, we need to now take this as a wake-up call. And then, of course, there's AI, artificial intelligence, the internet of things. Transhumanism. What is transhumanism? Humans mixing with technology to become stronger, faster, better. So that's where it's already happening. If you've got a pacemaker in your heart, you've got technology in your body. 
There's tablets now. There's things that they can put in your body that, that is part of... They're trying to create super soldiers to help them see better, hear better, heal quicker. Using all different kinds of DNA and technology. The internet of things, how everything's connected. Our whole lives will soon be connected. Have you noticed? You can be sitting there. We did it the other day as an experiment. Sitting there, our phones are lying there on the side, and we talk about something like, hmm, I wonder how much a new set of sheets cost. Yeah, I want to get a new duvet. Two minutes later, you're looking at your phone, says, looking for a duvet? Sheets, now on sale. Like, <laughs> have you ever noticed it? Can I get a witness? There you go. Some of you have noticed that. Why? Because your phone's listening to you and it's picking up. This guy's looking for sheets. Let's see if we can lead him to show him where some sheets are. There's an internet of things where we're all connected. If we don't wake up, these things are going to overtake us and we as Christians are going to be sitting in the corner saying, Lord, come quickly. We need to be aware. Things are happening. We need to be the leaders in the field. This needs to be a place when people talk about UFOs. They say, I'm not afraid of that subject. Let's talk about that. Have you known that this might be a deception? Something to take our eyes off the truth? I believe there's a great deception coming and we as believers need to have our eyes unveiled to see the truth of who Jesus is. No, no, I've gone on a little bit longer. But this message could have taken a lot longer if I had given you all the references. But I want you to wake up to the fact there are things people are discussing, even in the world right now. People that, that are credible, that have degrees, are talking about these things. And we as Christians need to be aware of what's going on. What about art and entertainment? Your children are being spoon-fed these things. You guys are being spoon-fed these things. I mean, we just saw venom the other day. You know, that's come out. What's that? It's an alien from another planet. Lands in the amalgamates of the man. So the man's got the alien in him. It's just like demon possession to me. Man's no longer in control. The thing's in control. Stronger, faster, more powerful. If you've ever seen a demon possessed man, you know what I'm talking about. Yet our, our children are watching these everywhere. Their minds are open to it. They're really accepting the fact that these things may be possible. And then, of course, there's religion. The world is bringing us to a place of a one-world religion where we can embrace these as brothers, embrace these creatures, whatever they are, deception, through a one-world global religion. It's time for us to wake up. But, and this is where we end today, it's not over. Jesus is can you call? Come on, let's hear it. Jesus let's try again. Jesus came before and Jesus, Jesus will come again. And you know what he said to me in his word? He says, I'm going away. But I'm gonna leave you with a gift. I'm gonna leave you with a gift. So it's Christmas time. Who doesn't want a gift? This is my Christmas message. It's a message saying, Jesus came, we worship as the shepherds, we look to the sky, and even as believers, Jesus says, look to the sky. But you've got to know what you're looking for. Don't be looking for aliens. And if you come and think, well, this message wasn't for me today, I'm not just talking about aliens. Alien means foreign. You may be worshipping other foreign gods. You may be worshipping your drugs. You may be wor worshipping alcohol. You may be worshipping another woman who's not your wife. That's alien in your body. Alien is taking our eyes off the truth. It's foreign. We used to sing a song. And I will serve no foreign God. Or any other. No foreign gods. Not here. So Jesus said, guys, I've got a gift for you this Christmas. Who wants that gift? Come on. Who wants a gift? Yes, I love it. That's why you're here today. Let's receive the gift. There it is in John chapter 14. I am leaving you with a gift, says Jesus. Peace of heart and mind. Peace of mind and heart. That's why I need you. Stop stressing. Stop worrying. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. The peace I give you is a gift. The world cannot give. So here we're sitting here with this floating anxiety, stressing. What's going to happen? Where's my future? How's this? 
Jesus says, I've given you peace. Settle down, settle down. Yeah. I've got a gift. You know why you're not feeling it? Because you haven't unwrapped it yet. Maybe today's the day you unwrap that gift of peace. Some of you are sitting here, you have no peace in your heart. Jesus said, don't be troubled or afraid. Remember when the angel came, he said, don't be afraid. When Jesus gives us a peace, it's not, uh, uh, gives us a gift, it's not fear. Remember what I told you. Listen what Jesus said. I'm going away. There's the reference on the wall. I'm going away, but I will come back to you again. Can I get an amen? If you really love me, you would be happy that I'm going to my Father who is greater than I am. Now listen, this is the clincher for today. I have told you these things before. Turn to your neighbor and say before. Before they happen. So that when they do happen, you will believe. There's some strange stuff that We are living in strange times. We are living in times that we've never seen. Weird things in the sky. Weird things all over. Jesus said, I'm telling you now, these things are going to happen. Wake up, because I'm coming soon. I came once, and I'm coming again. Don't look to foreign saviors in the sky. Keep your eyes filled for the return of Jesus. So why don't you close your eyes right now? Some of you may have never heard a message like this before. Maybe it is an alien message to you. Strange. We're talking about some crazy stuff in church today. Maybe you're asking for the fear. You realize you're wasting your time. Well, I just want to say as your eyes are closed, if there's somebody here who has never, ever given your heart over to the Lord Jesus Christ, never recognized him and said, you know, right, right now I recognize it as a God. And you may be in your age. And I want you to come and give you this peace and I love you to live in my heart. If you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, accept this gift, then I'd like you to raise your hand right where you sit. I want us to pass this opportunity. Thank you. Just raise your hand and you can put it down again. Thank you, my sister. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand. You raise it and then drop it again. I see your hand. The reason why you're here today is because the Lord has brought you here for a reason. And that's to me. My sister, I just want to tell you that Jesus loves you more than you. He doesn't want you to live like this in fear. So right now, I'm going to pray a prayer. Asking Jesus to come into our lives. If you want to say that prayer with me, in, in support of those who have it, I love you to join your voices with mine. But I'd love you to pray something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, today I recognize that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That you came before and you will come again. That you lived here on this earth as the sinless son of God. That you died on a cross for me. That you rose from the dead for me. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. Cleanse me. Wash me. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let me know that I am your child. Today, I choose to follow after you for the rest of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. With our eyes closed, I'm going to pray another prayer. And this prayer is for those of you who have allowed fear to fill your heart. Jesus said, I've got to give you peace. But during the last two years of the pandemic, of the, the loss of finances, the loss of jobs, perhaps even death in your family. You have become filled with fear. You have allowed fear to have a place in your home. I want to pray for you. Stand to your feet. Don't be afraid anymore. I stand to your feet. You're saying, I'm taking a stand. That's why I want you to stand. Because I want you to be bold. Now you need to face that fear in the face. Stand to your feet. I want to pray you. you are, right? Let's stand together and say, I'm no longer going to allow fear to control me. I'm a child of the living God. Remember, this is just between you and God, but the reason I'm asking you to stand to your feet 
because it's a sign that you're getting up and you're getting ready for action. I don't want to be seated anymore. I'm not going to be seated any longer and allow fear to run ramshot over my life or over my family. So in your heart, just begin to pray. Father, I thank you that I'm your child. I will not allow this fear to grip my heart any longer. I will not allow fear to control my thinking. I rebuke you, spirit of fear. You've had access in my life for far too long. The word of God says, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of sound mind. Father, today I stand here unashamedly your child. And I call on your holy name and ask that you come right now as rivers of living water begin to flow over your life. Imagine yourself standing under a, a waterfall in a beautiful, beautiful place, safe and secure, and allowing His Holy Spirit to wash your, your mind, to cleanse your heart. He's looking at you again with fresh eyes and saying, I love you, my daughter. I see you, my son. I'm proud of you, my boy. I forgive you to chase me today. Let it go. Take your hands and let go of that fear. Dump it in the river, leave it in the water. Let it get washed away. Receive his peace in Jesus' name. Receive his peace. Father, I thank you that you have given me the gift of peace. Today I choose to unwrap that gift and make it mine. I want to thank you that your promises are yes and amen and that you are faithful. As I walk out of here, I will not pick up that fear which I left in this church today. This is a turning point for you, my sister. Leave the fear here. Walk in wholeness. So let's all stand together as we bring the service to a close. Worship team, some of them are just going to last to sing in person. If you want to sit for a few seconds after it, you're welcome. If you want someone to pray for you, you're welcome. But as I look at you, Look in your eyes and look at me now. I just want to say that Father God is a good God. He is a God that will not allow the enemy to destroy you. May God, the God of love, hold you closely in your arms. May you feel His passion for you. May you know that he is all forgiving, all loving, and he wants his best for you. May his son, Jesus Christ, become a living king of your heart. That as you walk with him every day, speaking to him, praising him, thanking him, worshipping him. May your voice in your life be a song of praise. May his Holy Spirit, which he said to live in you, guard your heart and mind. There's a sentry standing over it, saying, no more. This is a child of the King. Today is your day. Holy Spirit, have your way in us. Fill us with your joy. And as we leave this place today, we thank you for new beginnings. We ask all of this in the precious name that is above every other name. The name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for joining us.